Anytime, anywhere. ABC News Now. Start here. Hello and welcome to Time Tunnel, where we find out what was making news in the past. I'm Alicia Davis in New York, and today we travel back to this day in 1976. Harry Reisner had the news. Good evening. There were primary elections in the country yesterday, and one of the most important was in Missouri to select a Democrat to run for the Senate seat of Stuart Symington, who is retiring. Symington's son was in the race, and another strong contender. But soon after the polls closed, it was apparent that the winner was a dynamic young millionaire named Jerry Litton, a congressman and a cattle breeder. The only trouble is that by then, Jerry Litton and his family, wife and two sons, were dead, killed in the plane that was flying them to Kansas City. Bob Worley of KMBC TV reports. In his nearly two terms as a congressman, Jerry Litton combined a country boy image as a millionaire cattle rancher with slick media techniques. Constituents gathered monthly to hear Litton hold discussions with well-known guests. A televised version was aired statewide, giving him exposure even before he decided to battle for the Senate seat. At age 39, Litton won an upset victory. But before he ever knew he won, Litton's twin-engine plane crashed and burned on takeoff from his hometown airport last night. Litton, his wife, and two teenage children, and two others were all killed. They were on their way to what would have been a victory party in Kansas City. Federal investigators say it may take weeks to determine the cause of the crash. Everything appeared normal until the plane went down. When word of the accident reached Litton's campaign headquarters in Kansas City, the atmosphere changed from one of anticipation to one of stunned silence. Teletypes kept clicking away with election returns, but the congressman's supporters now were praying and weeping. become one of Missouri's hottest political properties. Now it will be the state Democratic Committee, not the voters, who will choose the party's Senate nominee. This is Bob Worley in Kansas City for ABC News. The mysterious ailment they are calling Legionnaire's disease now has killed 22 people, hospitalized 131 others, and may have hit people outside Pennsylvania. Sick people with similar symptoms have turned up in New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and in one case, California. All had been in Philadelphia at the time of the American Legion State Convention. HEW Secretary David Matthews, who briefed President Ford today, said the illness will be identified tomorrow at the earliest. Robert Miller has more. This is the State Health Department lab in Philadelphia. On Monday, this facility received blood and tissue samples from 30 of the victims, both dead and those hospitalized with the illness. Fifteen medical experts are working around the clock to identify the killer disease. The samples are split in half for analysis, with one half cultured here and the rest sent to the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta for identical tests. The head of the Pennsylvania Virology Lab studying the disease says it could be a new form of the flu. If it isn't influenza, and it's going to be a very atypical influenza because of the large mortality rate that we're seeing, and the sudden onset of the disease, particularly in a very select population. I think if this is a virus, it is a very unique virus. What it's going to do, uh, God only knows. Messengers are continuing to bring in specimens from throughout the state. But since it takes 48 to 72 hours for cultures to develop, doctors will not be able to examine even the first samples from Monday until midnight tonight. They hope for results early tomorrow. Robert Miller, ABC News, Philadelphia. Not guilty pleas were entered today in Justice Court in Chowchilla, California, by two of the three men accused of kidnapping 26 school children and their bus driver. The third man pleaded innocent last week. Bill Redeker has the details. It was the first time the three appeared together since their arrest. James Schoenfeld and Fred Woods left the Alameda County Jail in Oakland early this morning to meet Richard Schoenfeld for the trip to Chowchilla. Since security was a major concern, the suspects were flown to the small town in a private airplane. Security was also tied outside the courthouse, with sharpshooters strategically positioned around the building. Inside, the session lasted only 40 minutes. 
First, Woods, dressed in a dark blue suit, and James Schoenfeld, wearing the same clothing in which he was arrested, were arraigned. Judge Howard Green read them their rights and told them what he had told the younger Schoenfeld last week. Conviction carries a life imprisonment term. None of the three showed any reaction when attorneys entered not guilty pleas to the 43 counts of kidnapping and robbery. Then, as spectators, including two parents of the kidnapped children, looked on, Richard Schoenfeld's attorney, William Gagan, argued that the $1 million bail was too high, that the family couldn't pay it, but Judge Green refused to reduce the amount. Bus driver Ed Ray was in the front row of the spectator section during the hearing. Afterwards, he refused to say whether he recognized the trio. He also had no comment on the bail, but defense attorney Gagan did. Well, it's, it's my feeling, and uh, I think it's consistent with the reality that a million-dollar bail is tantamount to no bail at all. Uh, the person just can't make that kind of bail, therefore it ceases to be reasonable. The three were returned to separate jail facilities, but they will be brought back here. A preliminary hearing has been set for August 26th, four days after Chowchilla honors its hero, the bus driver, in a day-long celebration. Bill Redeker, ABC News, Chowchilla, California. The presidential candidates were pursuing their individual strategies today. For Ronald Reagan, that involves gathering delegate strength where he can, while trying to assure his supporters that Richard Schweiker will help his chances for election. Reagan and Schweiker took that message to Mississippi. And Frank Reynolds has the story. The new team emerged from Reagan's campaign plane late this afternoon in Jackson to take their case to the wavering Mississippi delegation. After a bit of handshaking at the airport, they went to a nearby motel to begin their missionary work. But before confronting the delegates, they met with reporters. Reagan reached into the enemy camp to support his optimism about winning in Kansas City. Um, Chairman Morton of the Ford people has admitted after all of their claims of the last few weeks that neither side has it sewed up. That there, there's no one that has enough to go there yet on the first ballot. It is still uh, out there to be won. About the idea that Reagan and Schweiker have little in common, Reagan said this. Uh, he and I are identical in our views on national defense, on detente. Uh, we even agree on the Panama Canal. I don't think that I went opposite to compatibility with my philosophy. Schweiker also insisted they are compatible. He was asked what he would say to the Mississippi delegates. I'm, I'm going to tell them, first of all, that I don't have horns. Uh, second, I'm going to tell them that I even got a little bit of education in the South, having attended Georgia Military Academy. Uh, third, I'm going to tell them that my father and grandparents were Baptists, and that seems to be a factor this year. And uh, I do not grow peanuts. Schweiker may have to do a bit more than that. He will have to convince Mississippi delegates that he genuinely strengthens Reagan's chance to win the nomination. He can do that only by demonstrating that he is as popular in his natural constituency, the Northeast, as Reagan is in his. So Mississippi, as always anxious to be with the winner, will probably wait to see what Schweiker can do for the ticket up north before deciding whether he's acceptable down south. This is Frank Runnels, ABC News, with the Reagan Schweiker campaign in Jackson, Mississippi. The Ford tactics in the days before the Republican convention seemed to involve a holding action, holding on to both delegate strength and the image of a front runner. White House correspondent Tom Gerald reports on the latest developments. The president's bid to hold and win delegates revolves around a strategy of having friendly couriers of good news drop by, like Senator Clifford Case who told the candidate and then reporters, a late survey of his big New Jersey delegation shows no erosion to Reagan. This represents a, a reaffirmation and a confirmation of the feeling that most of us, including very definitely myself, have had about the president's strength all along. I think, just by personal view is, he's going to get the whole delegation. The Reagan pressure to name a Ford vice presidential choice is causing some problems. The nasty specter of Watergate is raised even by friendly Republicans opposing John Connolly, for example. Congressman William Cohen of the House Judiciary Committee wants the president to review the Nixon tapes in considering Connolly. From my point of view, John Connolly uh, symbolizes the, the power politics of, uh, of the 60s. It's an era that's gone by. I think that tape, the March 23, 1971 tape, uh, clearly uh, shows the type of power politics which the American people uh, no longer would uh, uh, tolerate. The numbers game continues, too. 
in a bid to break the pro-Reagan grip on the Virginia delegation, Ford campaign officials invited a number of the delegates by today and claimed some converts. However, the political claims of support are hard to substantiate because a few delegates shift almost daily, others can't be reached. Two in the New Jersey delegation have died, and the leader of the group won't even tell reporters who they were. Tom Jarrell, ABC News at the White House. Jimmy Carter was in Washington today working on tactics and strategy for his fall campaign. Yesterday, Carter said that he expects the Republican tactics to include a vicious and personal attack on him. Today, Carter sounded a similar warning. ABC's Sam Donaldson has more. Jimmy Carter, attending the first meeting of the National Democratic Campaign Steering Committee, told the influential Democrats there assembled he expects the Republicans to launch personal attacks on himself and running mate Walter Mondale. Reporters wanted to know what makes him so sure. They've begun to send out, the Republican uh, National Committee has, uh, all every adverse comment that's been made that's unconfirmed or that's been published in the news uh, to country newspapers and the radio stations. And I've noticed that surrogates for uh, President Ford in the Congress and otherwise have been uh, making speeches lately you know, about me personally. You really Thank think you, they're going to get dirty about it? No, well, I, well, I hope not. But, that's but I mean, belief. that's your fear. That's my concern. But I think we can withstand it, okay? Right. As Carter says, editors are in fact receiving material from the Republican National Committee with cover letters declaring, we feel that these will add to your understanding of Jimmy Carter. In large part, the material does consist of unverified news stories, some of them bearing lurid headlines that may or may not reflect the full truth of the matter. Forestalling complacency among his supporters is obviously one of the reasons for Carter's prediction the Republicans will fight dirty. But there's at least one other reason. The Carter camp has successfully employed the same technique before, of issuing dire warnings about expected opposition tactics. Then when the opposition does mount an attack, even if that attack doesn't quite live up to the horror of the warnings, Carter is in a position to blunt it by saying, you see, I told you so. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, Washington. And that's all the time tunnel we have for today. Now back to the present with ABC News Now. Thank you.